You know, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God is always there for you. There for you, welcoming you home with, with open arms. And that is always good news, isn't it? Always good news that even if you find yourself in a place that you don't really want to be, that God's always there for you. And that no matter what the twists and turns in your life are, no matter how many confusing or, or challenging paths you find yourself on, that your Heavenly Father wants to welcome you home with open arms. I mean, Jesus made that point in a story that we call the prodigal son. Now, now the outline of the story might be familiar to you because it's one of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told. A young man leaves home, uh, lives it up, loses everything, ends up living on the streets, eventually makes his way back home. The prodigal returns. And what he finds is he returns is he's welcomed back by the father with, with open arms. But the word prodigal itself, maybe not quite as familiar outside the, the title of the story. I mean, I kind of thought from the context, I, I knew what prodigal meant, but I thought I'd better look it up anyway. And when I did, I found this kind of two-word uh, definition. Prodigal means recklessly extravagant. And I kind of thought I knew what extravagant meant too, and you probably do as well. You probably got some good examples of that. But again, I, I looked it up. Let me read you that definition of extravagant. Exceeding the limits of reason or necessity, lacking in balance, moderation, and restraint. Spending much more than necessary. So for the purposes of this conversation that we're into today, I, I want to condense that into something that's maybe a little easier to remember. Okay? Prodigal equals radically extravagant, or recklessly extravagant, equals uh, over the top. Over the top. And that certainly applied to how the younger son in Jesus' story led his life and dealt with his inheritance. But let me ask you this. Are there other characters in the story to which that same designation, prodigal, um, recklessly extravagant, over the top, could, could apply? Let's see. You find the story in, in Luke chapter 15. Listen. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, 
You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now Jesus first told this story to Pharisees. Okay, and, and Pharisees were church people. Very good church people. I mean, they were rule keepers, not rule breakers. And while there's certainly something in this story for everyone, I mean, since there are plenty of people hanging around Jesus here listening who Luke describes as tax collectors and, and sinners, I think what Jesus is doing here is he's telling the stories to, to Pharisees who are here muttering about Jesus associating with who they consider undesirables. And so I think it's not a really big leap here at all to think of, of Jesus as telling the story about, well, two church kids. Uh, now, to update the story, you, you could tell it this way. One kid goes off to college and, well, never looks back. The church is in the rear view mirror, same with family. Uh, he's living for self, and he's living it up, and he's doing the same sort of stuff that the crowd he runs with does, uh, sort of a, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, because that's what I want to do. That's his creed. <laughs> Sound familiar? And he's enjoying life, but things are still a little, well, off. And uh, there's still a lot of emptiness in his life that isn't being filled by all this. And that's going to become quite evident to him when, well, life happens. Uh, the other kid, well, he stays home. He's still in church most of the time. He helps out both at church and at home. Uh, he probably plays in the band or sings in the choir. Everyone would look around and call him good, so he's living, well, the right life. But, but something's still, again, a little off, and there's not a whole lot of joy in his life, and his heart's starting to get sort of hard and judgy. And both these men are what I'd call, well, prodigal, recklessly extravagant, over the top. What I mean by that? Well, well son number one, He's recklessly extravagant. He's over the top in doing it my way. And son number two, well, if you follow the story to the end, he's recklessly extravagant and over the top in rigidity and rule keeping and, and what I'd call a joyless judginess. And, and while they seem at first glance to be like total opposites in, in behavior, their issues actually end up being quite similar. And both sons are in the wrong. And both their choices end up being bad ones, which is part of the point that Jesus wants us to see here. The younger brother's issues? I deserve this because I'm your kid. That's entitlement. Um, What's with these rules and, and, and restrictions and, and boundaries, this, this moral compass? It's so confining. It's just cramping my style, which is resentment. And it's my life to do with as I please. I just want to find myself. I want to define myself, which is I'm going to live for me and for me alone, uh, which, well, with the younger son didn't really end up working out very well, did it? I mean, the younger son ended up a long way from home and no real idea if he could figure out how to get back home if, if they'd even accept him back. He, he hadn't realized how good he'd had it at home in the father's house. And, and when he did, he, he began to think that well, maybe it was too late. Now, the older brother, he made different choices. He decided to stay home, and on first reading of the story, you'd say, yeah, he made better choices. He stayed home the whole time. But again, if you read to the end of the story, what you find is the older brother's issues were pretty much the same as the younger brother's issues. Uh, I deserve this because I stayed home, because I slaved for you, because I did all this stuff for you. That's what? That's entitlement too. And the, didn't you notice, Dad, what I did? Uh, shouldn't I get a bigger and better reward? It's not fair. That's resentment. 
resentment not just of the younger brother, but, but resentment of the father's love. I mean, and then this last one, well, I performed pretty well. I performed really well. So if I want to be harsh, I'm going to be harsh. If I want to be judgmental, it's within my right. If I don't want to forgive, I don't have to. Because, well, that's I live for me and, and for me alone. Results of that? Well, the older son ends up being frustrated and angry and bitter. And where is he? He's outside the house while the celebration's going on. Outside the father's house, which is the exact same place that the younger son was at the beginning of the story. Seems to me as if entitlement and resentment and I'll live for me and me alone, that those aren't really something to be over the top about, uh, no matter where in your life that seems to pop up. Take a few minutes to stop and reflect on that before we move on in this conversation. Ask yourself, which of those things, entitlement or resentment or I'll live for me, do you find to be the most challenging? And then follow that up with talking about this. Which of the sons in the story, the younger son or the older son, do you find yourself identifying with more? Go ahead and hit pause and do that right now. Sometimes I find myself relating to son number one, but, but more times, probably because I've been stayed home in the church for so long, I kind of find myself relating with son number two. But Jesus' point here is that neither son, neither the younger nor the older one, were in a good place. And that entitlement and resentment and I'll live for me and, and me alone, that those aren't things to be over the top about no matter where they crop up in your life. Now in the story, when the younger son realized where that got him, he, he headed back home, but he really couldn't conceive of being welcomed back by the father on the same terms as before. Not after all he'd done. Not after all he'd done to destroy the family's reputation. Not after all he'd done to cost the family money. Not after all he'd done to, to stick a knife in his father's heart. I mean, what was the speech that he rehearsed over and over again on the way back home? Let me read it to you. Verse 18. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your, here it is, hired servants. Maybe you'll take me back, but I don't expect it to be the same. I don't really expect a welcome. And, and the older son, you know, he's actually got the same issue as the younger son does here. He can't conceive of his father welcoming back the younger son either. And he can't understand how the father could be so, so gracious and so loving and forgiving to the guy who had cost the family that much and... and messed up their, their reputation and, and messed up so bad. I mean, what he's probably thinking when he hears that the younger son is, is come back in town, he's probably thinking of some elaborate community shunning ceremony, not, not a celebration. See, he wants his pound of flesh. He wants his younger brother to get what he deserves for all those horrible choices. He wants to make him pay. He wants to make him pay for what he did and what he cost the family. He wants justice with this overdeveloped sense of, of fairness. And the older brother can't conceive of the father being gracious because, well, he's not. Th that part of the father's character had never rubbed off on him, even after all these years. And so both a younger and older son are still stuck which makes the hero of the story here for both brothers, the father. The hero of the story is the father because both sons deserved the father's rebuke, yet in the story, what they get, what both sons get is the father's undeserved and unconditional love in spite of everything that they've done, in spite of the younger son's disobedience and, and reckless behavior. 
the father restores the relationship through a total, reckless, extravagant love, which he, he showers on him before the son did anything to show that he deserved it. I mean, the way Jesus tells the story, the father is, while the son's still a long way off, the father's running out to meet him, which no self-respecting head of the family would do in those days, hike up in robes and, and run. Um, the father welcomes him home even before those well-rehearsed words of confession even get out of his mouth. He welcomes him home and he gives him status again to show he's welcome. He puts, gives him the robe and, and the ring of the family and the, puts the sandals on his feet. And he throws him a party before the young son did anything to make it right. And if you look closely, it's the same with the older son. In spite of the older son's disrespectful behavior toward the father, in spite of the fact that this older son is bitter and, and joyless and, and resentful, full because of some perceived slight, despite the fact that the older son just really wants the, the father to, to get something out of the father, in spite of all that, what you see at the end of the story is the father humbles himself and he lays aside his own rights and prestige as the leader of the family and he does something that, that the leader family wouldn't do, shouldn't do. He goes outside of the feast that's in, in celebration there, in his own honor that his son is back. And he goes out to initiate contact where, where the older son is. He, he goes and takes time to, to plead, to engage, to converse with the older son. Though the fair thing to do would have been to send some of his servants out there and tell his son, get yourself in here. The father doesn't do that. The father goes out to the older son and tries to get the older son to, to catch his heart and to get some of his sense of joy. So, so both these two very different brothers had essentially those same heart issues. They had entitlement and resentment and I'm going to live for me. Both found themselves in the story on the outside looking in because of it. And in both cases, it's the father who takes the initiative. The father who takes the initiative to fix things, to restore the relationship, to make it right, to help them experience joy. And you know what? Now I think we're getting somewhere. Because now what this, we're starting to see what this story tells us about Jesus. And about how Jesus relates to the younger brotherish and older brotherish tendencies that are at work in us today. When I see it this way, what I see is that, that Jesus loves lost people, both inside and outside the church. That Jesus loves wayward people, both inside and outside the church. That Jesus loves messed up people, both inside and outside the church. And Jesus initiates contact with people who are stuck in and entitlement and resentment, and I'm going to live for me and me alone. And, and he leads with grace. He leads not with judgment, but with grace. See, Jesus wants to change people's attitudes, both inside and outside the church. And he wants to lead us away from those self-destructive attitudes of, of entitlement and resentment and I'm going to live for me and me alone. And he wants to lead us toward finding the Father's heart. He wants to lead us toward experiencing grace. He wants to lead us toward experiencing joy. And he wants to lead us toward discovering that forgiveness is a much better option than fairness. And when you see that, I think you start to see that the big point of Jesus' story is that it's the Father who's prodigal here. The father who's recklessly extravagant. The father who's over the, the top in, in love. Which means, you know what? If, if you've messed up, uh, you're not beyond redemption. That God still loves you and, and welcomes you home with open arms and restores your status. It means you can start fresh. It, it means you can live better. Grace is actually that powerful. And if you find yourself being resentful of others and the mess that they've made, not only of themselves, but of you and the family, if 
you find yourself sort of resenting God's love for others even though you know that you really shouldn't, well, Jesus is telling you that you too can change and you too can start fresh and you too can find joy again. You can even move beyond that overdeveloped sense of, of fairness that leaves you so frustrated. What he's saying is, if you've really messed up and made a bunch of bad choices, you can know that this is who God is. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. And if you've really messed up and been too harsh toward other people, Jesus is saying you can know the same thing. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. I think that what Jesus wants us to see is that the father is the real hero of the story. That yes, the younger son is a prodigal, the older son is prodigal, but the father is also a prodigal. In fact, you could say that the father here in the story is the prodigal. The prodigal who's recklessly extravagant and over the top in grace and mercy and forgiveness. The father who's radically extravagant, recklessly extravagant and over the top in joy and celebration. The father who's recklessly extravagant and over the top in love. For God so loved the world, all of us, you and me. He loved us so much he sent his only son, Jesus. The firstborn of creation, sent to take our place, to bear our burden, to suffer our consequence. We were far from God. But God didn't want to be far from us. Jesus came to bring us home. As a prodigal returns to their father, so too could we return to our Creator. A simple plan with just one requirement. Belief. For whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have life, life eternal. At the very heart of God is love, indescribable, unrelenting, unstoppable love. That love shines a light guiding us home for God so loved the world.